Everyone has someone or something that drew them into fitness. An origin story that forever changed their lives, compelling them to pick up their first weight. I joined a gym at 18 in the early 90s. Back then information was scarce. The internet was in its infancy and everyone involved with bodybuilding was just blindly feeling their way through with magazine information or gym bro imitation. I had some passing interest in the magazines, but it wasn't until browsing the aisles of a blockbuster video store one day that I came across Pumping Iron and that finally brought these characters in the magazines to life. Like many others, Pumping Iron drew us into a world of bodybuilding like nothing else. It became a wellspring of motivation and inspiration, a film we quoted back to each other and re-watched again and again. These days we are saturated with media and direct access to today's fitness icons 24-7. But it wasn't always like that. Prior to Pumping Iron's release, bodybuilding was in the eyes of the public, mostly out of sight and out of mind. Mainstream depictions of bodybuilders were mostly negative and laced with misconceptions and stereotypes. Based on a book of the same name, Pumping Iron was released in 1977 alongside other notable films including Star Wars and Spielberg's Close Encounters. The brainchild of authors George Butler and Charles Gaines, both the book and the film aimed at defining bodybuilding to the public, presenting it as an art form, and making it interesting to the outside world. Butler and Gaines envisioned dragging the subject of bodybuilding from its humble origins and out of its dark basement gyms and into the public spotlight. In doing so, the combination of the book and the film shattered many of the stereotypes of this otherwise shadowy subculture. This small budget indie film was to forever change the landscape of bodybuilding and catapult the future star of Arnold Schwarzenegger into public consciousness. Although he was no stranger to the screen, at the time of the film's release Arnold Schwarzenegger was a virtual unknown to the mainstream. Having already appeared multiple times on television and in big screen write-offs such as Hercules in New York and the more critically acclaimed Stay Hungry. It seemed Arnold was destined for a lifetime of lesser strongman roles like Steve Reeves and Reg Park before him. But Arnold was by no means a down and out bodybuilder living in his car, chasing unrealistic fantasies and dreams of superstardom. Despite his less than auspicious screen appearances, Arnold was already king of the small world of bodybuilding, having already won six Mr. Olympia titles, appearing on multiple magazine covers, and making a small fortune in real estate and investments. Butler and Gaines recognised Arnold's star potential from the outset, whereupon on their very first meeting, Arnold articulated his well thought out life plan in which he would one day become a movie star, marry an American princess and eventually get into politics. Arnold was set to retire from the bodybuilding scene he had already conquered when Butler made his proposal. He wanted Arnold to head up their documentary which was based on Butler and Gaines' book of the same title. Written in 1974, the book had already done a successful job of peeling back the curtain on the subculture of bodybuilding and was a revealing portrait of some of its more popular personalities. It enjoyed a year on the bestseller list due to its ability to capture the essence of the sport, its history, and feature in a positive way many of the characters who embodied it. Through their masterful prose, Gaines and Butler captured more than just the resonance of the peculiarity of the sport's physiques. They depicted bodybuilding as a tasteful art form that finally gave some legitimacy to the activity in the eyes of the mainstream public. Butler's photography was particularly acute in capturing that fly on the wall, outsider's perspective that distinguished bodybuilders from the often cartoonish magazine portrayals of the sport. On setting out to parlay the book's success into a film, Butler was met with fierce resistance, including his partner Gaines, who according to Butler, initially deserted him on the project. A small test film screened for potential investors turned Butler into a laughing stock and his project into one of scorn and derision. Most of the audience had never heard of Schwarzenegger and they laughed when he came on camera, Butler states. When he stripped off and oiled himself up, someone groaned loudly. Butler had already given everyone a photocopy sheet of information and he was about to deliver a pitch that he had rehearsed endlessly when someone in the crowd who was a prize winning writer stood up and said, George. Don't go any further, where are all your friends and if you ever put this oaf on the screen, you'll be laughed off 42nd Street. Putting aside the fact that Arnold would eventually go on to own most of 42nd Street, the ridicule from investors was initially demotivating. Charles Gaines said it was like trying to promote Richard wrestling. It was so tawdry, everyone we knew was laughing at us. 
There was no interest and definitely no money to be found in the sport of bodybuilding. The prize money for contests was abysmal. Contests lacked any prestige and were held in dingy auditoriums for minimal crowds. Bodybuilders needed to hold on to other jobs to support their otherwise sideline hobby of constructing their physiques. Even gyms at the time held little promise at turning a profit, and guys like Joe Gold, the creator of Gold's Gym, where the documentary was shot, ran the gym more out of passion than for profit. On receiving his cheque for his fourth Mr. Olympia win, Arnold shook his head and commented in disgust, saying, What the f*** is this? I spend this much every week on vitamins. Nevertheless, to persuade a hesitant and now retired Arnold to appear in their film, Butler promised him a fee of $50,000 and 5% of the net. Butler had initially wanted to make a film about bodybuilding from an outsider's perspective. Using then publicly recognisable actor Bud Court, Court would visit Gold's gym and receive training from Arnold. But Court, recognising the mismatch from the outset, pulled out of the film leaving Butler to focus on the bodybuilders themselves. Butler had the foresight to know that featuring the technical aspects of the sport, the training and nutrition and even the spectacle of the larger than life physiques wouldn't hold an audience's attention for 90 minutes. Instead it would be the personalities and the competitive drama that would ultimately capture audience interest and create talking points about the film. By exaggerating and blurring the lines between fact and fiction, Pumping Iron was relatively unique in its construction as a docudrama. Characters in the film were provided with direction on how to amplify the emotional resonance of certain scenes. The filmmakers used confessional side interviews which helped overplay the tension and drama between the competitors, and which was later imitated in the future by reality TV style shows. As Arnold explained later, investors asked, how much can we look at this footage of them doing squats and chin ups and sit ups and all this? It's boring. Even though it's exciting to them, it's boring for us to watch. It was therefore decided to add some drama and some conflict, which would raise the audience's temperature. Butler acknowledged some of these contrivances, but wanting to move bodybuilding into an acceptable arena, he stated that, All of the scenes in Pumping Iron were true to the sport and true to the individual. Nothing in the movie was pure fiction. However, Butler still recognised that the role of a good documentarian is first and foremost to create a narrative that takes viewers on an emotional journey. In order to create connections with the audience, each character in the film is presented as a distinct and recognisable personality. We have in Arnold the Machiavellian and stoic hero, Mike Katz as the everyman lovable loser, Ken Waller as the imposing bully, Franco as the sidekick, content to live in Arnold's shadow. Then there's Lou Ferrigno who at first was imagined by Butler as a potential antagonist who could rival Arnold in the size game stakes, but he later emerged as a more vulnerable underdog personality. Due to Lou having a hearing and speech disability, it greatly hampered his ability to converse and articulate himself clearly on film. So one of the more interesting character inventions was Lou's father, Matty Ferrigno, whose role was contrived by Butler as Lou's trainer and surrogate mouthpiece. Maddie, who previously had no interest or motivation to help Lou train, accepted the newly invented role with enthusiasm, and he hams it up with every opportunity. You look at your arms like you're admiring, right? You're admiring what you're going to show them. And then you go, boom, like you're saying, take a look at this hunk of man. Something like that, okay? You try it. Lou had originally trained with the former Mr. American competitor, Steve McCallick, who was infamous for his grueling intensity or insanity workouts. Steve himself was making a comeback and was training for the 1975 Nabba Mr. Universe, so it would have been an interesting on-screen duo if Butler hadn't intervened with the father Maddie subplot. Steve also corroborated that Maddie's involvement with Lou's training ultimately did more harm than good as he lacked the proper direction and assessment needed to refine Lou's physique for the upcoming clash with Arnold. Steve went on to win the toll class at the Mr. Universe and was on his way to take up Arnold's challenge to participate in the Mr. Olympia when Steve was run over by a wayward dump truck. Although an unlikely threat, it would have been an interesting showdown if Steve was the antagonist for Arnold's Mr. Olympia aspirations, as Steve was very outspoken, intelligent, and rivaled Schwarzenegger in terms of his proportions. Butler had filmed multiple storylines, leaving many of the participants with the belief that if they won the Mr. Olympia, the resulting story would trend in favour of their narrative. 
Had they known that Charles Gaines was on the judging panel and Arnold was being incentivized with such a large payment, it might have realistically reshaped their expectations. As Wendy Lee notes, basically all the participants in Pumping Iron, with the exception of Arnold, are diminished. Indeed, if Arnold had hired a top PR firm and invested millions to have a film made promoting him, they probably couldn't have improved on Pumping Iron. So realistically, every one of the characters apart from Arnold are relegated to mere supporting roles, orbiting Arnold's burgeoning star vehicle. The film promotes from the outset that it's starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, accompanied by a soon-to-be-forgotten everyone else. Arnold embodies the quintessential qualities of a champion, a superior mind and a superior body, and the documentary does all it can to underscore this with the shifts in the emotional tone of the music whenever Arnold appears on the screen. In contrast to Lou, he is depicted as still being housebound, living with his parents and training in gloomy Brooklyn, while Arnold is surrounded by sun, sand and sex appeal. For Lou, all of these elements are conspicuously absent. Arnold is the pivotal linchpin and spokesperson of projecting all the positive aspects of bodybuilding that Butler wants to portray. And one of the generational appeals of the film is the way the creators capture the elements of fun and camaraderie of the time. As Arnold remarked in an issue of Playboy, In the old days, bodybuilders talked about eating 2 pounds of meat and 30 eggs a day, how they had to sleep 12 hours a day and couldn't have sex and so on, and I said to myself, who the f*** wants to be part of that kind of sport? First of all, if you want to make people join a particular activity, you have to make it sound fun. It's like promoting anything. You make it fun, and I talked about the diet and I said I eat cake and ice cream as well. I would stay out nights and I'd have sex and I'd do all the things that everybody says you shouldn't do. And there are hundreds of different ways of, of, of trimming down your body weight or getting away with eating cake. Uh, my way is that I eat the cake mm -hmm. and then I just uh, train harder the next day to burn it off mm -hmm. rather than to eat less the next day. I mean, I will very rarely, you know, cut back on, a, on a eating uh, because uh, I enjoy eating and I think that if you run every day and if you work out, you can afford doing that. Okay. The golden era appeal is largely due to these guys pursuing bodybuilding for the love and the expression of the sport. The workouts became opportunities for bonding and brotherhood. Bodybuilders were marginalised outcasts in a small pocket on the fringes and, and gyms became the social glue that held the group together against a society that held them at arm's length. The potential for a profit and stardom were next to nil, so they were more likely to help each other out and bring out the best in each other. The era of big money contracts and endorsements weren't yet a reality, so the motivation to fight over a limited pie that often tarnishes relationships hadn't yet pervaded the sport. For this reason, I think this is why the extreme elements of bodybuilding, especially those of diet and steroids, are left out of the film. The workouts, although tough, are often skylit affairs, surrounded by girls and support from peers, and practically on the doorstep of the beach, followed by feeding frenzies with friends and tanning sessions lazing by the ocean. It's an idyllic existence that stands in stark contrast to the rat race that many people feel hopelessly constrained by. There's little doubt that the film motivated many to leave their small lives and travel to Venice Beach to be part of the positive beacon that Arnold and his Iron Brethren had projected. If getting the film off the ground seemed like a Herculean heavy lift, completing it became a financial Sisyphean task of magnitude. Bringing the film to completion was to take another two years due to financial roadblocks. It's interesting to again highlight that part of coaxing Arnold to appear in the documentary cost Butler & Co. $50,000 plus 5% of the net, while the other cast members received a mere $100 per day for their participation, only on their threat of mutineering the project. What's interesting is that the IFBB had basically pulled off an astounding media win for all the exposure the film and book had given them, so it's kind of shitty that they didn't fund the film in any way. The consensus was that the Weeders didn't want any rapid expansion which might lead to them losing control of the business to other interests. Butler even beseeched the film lab to extend him a line of credit to assist in completing the film. After Butler divulged to the lab that the credit was for a bodybuilding film, the curious owner asked whether the unusual venture of Butler's had anything to do with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Butler of course said yes, and he was promptly denied the credit, only to learn that years later the lab had done work for Hercules in New York, but the company never got paid, losing out on $30,000. 
As part of the film's origin story, the appearance of Zane, Arnold and Ed Corney posing for New York societal upper crust in a seminar titled Articulate Muscle on February the 26th, 1976 at New York's Whitney Museum of Art was a last ditch fundraiser to earn the funds needed to complete the film. The exhibition was a massive success, selling out to a standing room only crowd of 2,500 paying an entrance fee of $5 each, which had to be thrown on the floor in piles by the organisers of fans, clamouring to get a chance, mostly to see Arnold in the flesh. The release of Stay Hungry in June 1976 and Arnold's receipt of the Golden Globe Award was a great lead-up marketing promotion for the release of Pumping Iron. The impossible film, premised on an impossible book, finally became a public reality two years later. It opened at the Plaza Theatre in New York and broke all box office records at the time. It was the darling of the Cannes Film Festival later that year. Pumping Iron was groundbreaking for its capacity to bring a niche, publicly disdained activity to the forefront of public consciousness. While it never achieved Butler's vision of making bodybuilding mainstream, it did desensitise the public to the appearance and process of bodybuilders, and it undoubtedly provided a springboard for the soon to explode fitness revolution. It was fortuitous in its timing, coinciding with the coalescing cultural demand for fitness aligned with the zeitgeist of self-improvement. It helped shape the emergence of a new breed of action hero. Arnold in Pumping Iron is basically the emerging precursor to the 80s archetype, and it was a natural fit for the roles he'd come to play in The Terminator and Conan, along with Stallone's Rambo and Wall Street's Gordon Gekko. He does what he needs to do to get things done, crushing anything and anyone that gets in his way. And this all ties in with the zeitgeist of the cultural emerging moral ambiguity of the time. A win at all costs mindset, ethics be damned. More than 100 hours of footage were shot of various competitors including a number of different bylines. There was lots of training footage and Arnold bought the rights and has it stored in his vault. It's unlikely whether we'll ever see the light of day, which is the biggest tragedy considering the treasure house of golden era footage that those reels must contain. Pumping Iron went on to become one of the most successful financial sporting documentaries, and it paved the way for other niche subculture films to be made. It's since gone on to become a visual touchstone and a cultural icon among generations of bodybuilders, and it preserves a magical time in bodybuilding forever in film. Thanks for watching. Please give the video a like and comment if you wish to see more golden era deep dives and retro analysis. My next video will be my four year journey on the ups and downs of the carnivore diet so please subscribe to catch future updates.